welcome to Peninsula Seniors Out and About. Today we're at the Western Museum of Flight in Torrance for one of their celebrity lectures. Let's go see what Cindy has for us today. Welcome everyone to the Western Museum of Flight. I'm Cindy Maka, the director. We Americans have for many years felt a justifiable pride in our nation's accomplishments in the field of space exploration. Through the efforts of American scientists, engineers, and technical experts of many kinds, human knowledge of the nature of our universe has expanded during the past half century, more than in all centuries preceding it. We thus owe a great debt of gratitude to the talented and competent people who have applied their intellectual energies to this magnificent effort. So we are fortunate today to have one of those talented and competent people visiting us. Jim McCurry has made impressive contributions to many of our nation's achievements in space exploration and has agreed to share some of his experiences with us. Ladies and gentlemen, Jim McCurry. Thank you, Cindy. It's a pleasure to have this opportunity to be here to share with you some of the experiences we had on the Mercury program on our way to putting John Glenn into orbit. And let me begin by refreshing your memory with some basic information on Mercury. Uh, we tend to remember it now as the first of three programs on our way to putting a man on the moon, but it didn't start out that way. When President Eisenhower uh, gave uh, the, the go-ahead on the program, it was to put us in a race with the Russians to put it, the first human being into orbit. That had not been done, and it was to use a one-man capsule, put it into low Earth orbit for a relatively very short mission duration. At low Earth orbit, to take the time it takes to go one rev around the world is 82 minutes, or roughly an hour and a half. So we're talking here about uh, mission durations that were anywhere from one and a half to four and a half hours. And bear in mind, please, as we go through this today, that much of what we were planning and attempting to do on Mercury hadn't been done before, and it really was a learn-as-you-go kind of program. Now, these are the players. President uh, Eisenhower wanted it to be a civilian program, uh, non-military, which is kind of ironic because the first seven astronauts were all active duty military test pilots but he gave the job to NASA, newly formed from the old NACA, and it was headquartered in uh, Langley Field in Virginia, and they formed a new group called the Space Task Group, which initially had about 125 people, mainly populated with research engineers and wind tunnel specialists from the labs there at uh, NASA Langley. Uh, the they did, though, go out, well, let me tell you that they put in charge then Dr. Robert Gilruth, who at the time was the uh, vice director of Langley. And then he went out here to California and selected the NASA head of the high-speed aircraft test facility at Edwards and brought him back to be the program uh, director. The uh, the capsule itself was designed by Max Faget, a, a NASA engineer, and a contract to build a spacecraft was given to McDonnell Aircraft Company in St. Louis. They were to build the capsule and the booster adapter. And they didn't have time to develop a launch vehicle, so they had to take what was available, and the only thing that was available at the time with enough lift power to do the job was the intercontinental ballistic missile the Air Force had, the Atlas, and this was being built by General Dynamics Astronautics uh, Convair Missile Division down at Kearney Mesa in San Diego. And its engines were all from North American Rocket Dyne in Canoga Park. It had an onboard GE radio guidance system that got its steering orders from the ground from a large Burroughs computer uh, there at the Cape. The Air Force had selected a civilian company newly formed to be their engineering group to do the system engineering and technical direction of the ballistic missile contractors 
and that was a company that started out as Rainbow Woolrich and then shortly thereafter changed their name to Space Technology Laboratories. And then shortly after that, a few years, they changed it once again to Thompson Rainbow Woolrich, or TRW as you know it, and then TRW was, of course became absorbed by Northrop Grumman a few years ago. So they were responsible for doing the system engineering and technical direction of the contractors, and in addition to developing the uh, guidance equations for the trajectory, and all the flights were to go out of Cape Canaveral. Now, we started out in STL, but when the Air Force uh, started the Aerospace Corporation in the summer of 1960, the Mercury Atlas program was one that transferred over, and so it uh, re went through the rest of the flights uh, there under uh, aerospace. So here is the, the basic vehicle. When you look at it, the Atlas itself was a great big stainless steel balloon. It was constructed out of uh, th very thin sheets of stainless steel that were formed and welded together. And unlike your air, normal aircraft or other missiles, it didn't have any secondary structures. So all the loads were taken out in the skin and it had to be constantly pressurized at five PSI so it didn't collapse and fall in on itself. It had two fuel tanks, or propellant tanks, I should say. The front end one was held the locks, the liquid oxygen. The rear one held the fuel, which was rocket propellant number one, which is a high-grade kerosene and they shared a common bulkhead in between to keep the weight down. It had uh, three main engines, the uh, two outer or booster engines, each put out 154,000 pounds of thrust apiece, and the sustainer engine put out 57,000, so combined they had the, the value of 365,000 pounds of th thrust at liftoff. The Atlas fully loaded at liftoff weight 200,000 pounds and the capsule added another 3,000 pounds so the thrust weight ratio at liftoff for the bird was just a little under 1.4 so it didn't exactly leap off the test stand when you turned it loose. The booster engines only burned for the first two minutes and 10 seconds of the flight. By well, that point in time we had burned enough propellant off that the sustainer engine had sufficient thrust to put the payload into orbit. So we had staging. We shut down the booster engines and the whole boat tail assembly that you see there separated from the rear end where the bottom of the fuel tank was and that whole assembly slid off on rails past the sustainer engine and was jettisoned in flight. Then the sustainer kept on for another three minutes and 10 seconds that it took to get the capsule up to insertion velocity and the right altitude. The sustainer engine could only control the missile in pitch and yaw, and so there were two 1,000-pound vernier engines on the side of the Atlas that provided roll control. There was one subsystem on the Atlas that was unique to the Mercury Atlas itself, and that was the abort sensing and implementation system. STL and Convair had gone, done a uh, a failure analysis and it identified 10 areas that if anything went wrong on one of those 10, it could jeopardize the pilot. And we, pilot safety was a big issue here. So there was a system that was designed and developed that monitored those two areas uh, to catch any problem that you would have. So we had on each of those areas two redundant sensor switches and the switches were designed to fail closed so that if you didn't have a switch say, uh, failure, it would complete an electric circuit and they were wired in series so that it took both of the switches closing to get an abort, but you could lose the sensor in flight and not lose your reliability portion there. If any of the two sensor systems closed, then it sent a signal to the canister. The canister then output a signal that shut down all the engines on the Atlas and sent signals up to the capsule area that unloosed the clamps that held the, the capsule to its adapter and then fired off the escape rocket so it would pull the capsule and the astronaut up and away from the Atlas before it came apart in a big explosion. 
And here you have a, a picture of the capsule itself in the launch configuration. For off the pad aborts and for really uh, the early flight just off the pad, they had this big rocket on the front uh, to be able to pull the, the capsule away from the booster. And coming back, the main body of the capsule, uh, it had its own reaction control system in there so that the pilot had the ability to control the orientation of the capsule in both pitch, roll, and yaw. But there wasn't enough thrust in those thrusters for him to change the altitude and certainly not enough to change the orbital plane. And then on the back end, you had the heat shield, which was used to absorb all the heating loads when they came back into uh, the atmosphere from orbit. And in back of that is the uh, escape, the uh, retro rocket package, excuse me, uh, that was used to deorbit the capsule uh, from orbit. And then the pilot could turn those, after he fired those, and they decelerated the capsule. Then he activated uh, bolts that exploded on those three straps and released the package. It had a small spring in it between it and the heat shield, and so that gently pushed that package out of the way so the heat shield could be fully deployed to take the heating loads coming in from uh, deorbiting. And here's a aerial shot of one of the Mercury Atlases on pad 14. There were four Atlas launch pads at Cape Canaveral, 11, 12, 13, and 14, as you went from southeast to northwest along the coast. And when Mercury came along, 14 was then dedicated to Mercury so they could modify the gantry upper stations and where they could build a white clean room that would completely enclose the capsule on the stand when they were working on it so you wouldn't get any foreign debris in there that could float around inside the capsule on orbit. As you can see, the stand is about a half a mile back from the uh, coastline there, and the blockhouse was in your lower left out of sight. The NASA control center that controlled all the, the Mercury capsule on orbit was located at Cape Canaveral at this time. They didn't move to Houston until Gemini. And so the control from there, and it was about a mile further to the right down the, the uh, coastline from the launch pad. The big structure that you see over on the left is the gantry, and that moved back and forth on uh, railroad tracks, and it's now in the launch position. The small structure that you see on the right-hand side of the vehicles there was the uh, umbilical tower, and it remained stationary there during the launch. Here's a closer view of it, and if you look closely at the base of the atlas and see the people standing down there, you get a pretty good idea of the size of this thing because all in all it was like 94 feet long. And the dark areas that you see down there on the right-hand side of the vehicle that's kind of a dark gray, that was one of two uh, hold-down fixtures that pivoted into the sides of the atlas, much like a pair of ice tongs, and it held the atlas rigid uh, through engine start, and then once you, the engines were up to full chamber pressure, that was sensed, and uh, the commands were given into hydraulic pistons that rotated those back and turned the bird loose so it could rise, and those two little silver doors that you see back there slammed shut to uh, make fairings, and it lifted off. Here, the STL Mercury Program Office had a number of responsibilities. Of course, the biggest one was to be the system engineering and tech direction of all the Atlas contractors. But it also had the requirement to work with uh, the Air Force and develop a pilot safety program that would make this intercontinental ballistic missile as safe to fly on as, let's say, a, a new experimental aircraft out at Edwards. To meet that, we did it with redundant systems on the Atlas, but we also had the abort sensing system then that provided it. It also had to be high reliability. We had to be able to demonstrate to NASA on paper before each flight that we had a 99.7% probability of being able to put the, the capsule into the desired orbit 
before we launched. Then we were responsible for going down and inspecting and recommending the Air Force to accept each of the missiles before they airshipped it to the Cape. We then followed the, the checkout procedures at the Cape and 10 days uh, before flight time, our group would fly to Florida. We'd review all the records down there and then three days prior to the uh, flight date, we met and gave a briefing to the commanding general of Space Systems Division and his uh, flight safety review board where we certified to the Air Force that the vehicle was ready for flight. And the general then had us turn around and give the same briefing to NASA management, the astronauts, the day before the flight in their flight readiness review where we and the Air Force certified to NASA that the booster was ready to go. Then we monitored the countdown, did a quick look uh, review of the telemetry data once we had inserted the capsule into orbit. Then we got a copy of the telemetry tapes and took them back with us to LA and spent the next two weeks going through them in detail, checking for failures or anomalies or even bad trends. Once we had completed that, we put together a briefing and the NASA management and the astronauts came out to our place. We spent a half a day giving them the review of the previous launch and we spent the other half of the day giving them the status of the upcoming vehicle in the factory. And then we were ready to start this cycle over again. And when things worked well, we could do it on two month cycles. This would be a good place to tell you some interesting information about the STL program manager for the Mercury Atlas program. His name was Bernhard Homan, H-O-H-M-A-N-N, and he went by the American name of Ben. Ben was a former German Luftwaffe civilian test pilot on the ME-163 uh, Comet rocket-powered aircraft. And he had over 30 powered and towed flights on that vehicle when they were doing the flight testing on the west end of Pinamunda Island. And they were doing the flight testing there while Von Braun and his crew were on the other side of the island lobbying uh, the missiles into England. So when it, the war was winding down and it looked like for sure they were gone, they decided they would rather turn themselves over to the Americans than to the Russians. And so they all uh, bailed out to the American army. Von Braun and his crew, as you well know, came back with the Army Ordnance people and went to White Sands, New Mexico, and then later on to the Redstone Arsenal there in Huntsville, Alabama. Ben went with the Air Force, ended up in the aircraft laboratory at Wright Field, where he soon then became the section head for the flight dynamics or flight development section of the aircraft laboratory. So it was from there that STL hired him to be the program manager because here he was a well-known and well-experienced uh, rocket test pilot. So he fit in very well with all seven of the astronauts. And he populated his program management uh, positions in the office initially by four or five engineers from the Atlas program there at STL. But he, having been at Wright Field, he wanted someone on his staff who had experience in an Air Force weapon system program office at Wright Field. So they knew how to do uh, piloted testing. So through a circuitous route and uh, mutual acquaintance, he found out that I had an advanced degree in high-speed aeronautics and propulsion, and I was at the present time working for North American in El Segundo on the B-70, and I had had three years of experience when I was in the Air Force in three different bomber WISPOs there at Wright Field. So he gave me, and I was right across the, uh, the runways from him there in Arbor Vita, there in El Segundo. So he gave me a phone call, explained to me who he was and what he had in mind, and said, would you be interested in interviewing for the possibility of coming to work for me on the Mercury Atlas program? Of course, I leaped at the chance to get in on the ground floor of this new manned space activity. 
So I could hardly wait to get over there. I interviewed with him. He made me an offer, and on the 1st of April in 1960, I joined STL and been on the Mercury program uh, 17 days before my 30th birthday. Once I was on the program, these were my responsibilities, and I quickly hired three additional senior systems engineers. I got Bob Olander from Markwart for the mechanical systems, uh, Bob Combs from North American for the engines, and Henry Cecil from RCA for the abort sensing system. I had two additional personal responsibilities on the program. One of them was my job was to follow the Air Force Blue Suit uh, Atlas test programs and uh, monitor and then uh, review any of the failures or anomalies that they had and then make an assessment of uh, what the potential effect would be on our program from those uh, happenings. Then in addition to that, starting with the second M8 Mercury Atlas flight, it was my responsibility to coordinate an upper winds uh, structural analysis that we ran during the countdown to know whether we were go or no go. And okay, now we were ready for our first flight, MA-1, from pad 14 down uh, at the Cape. And this was July the 29th of 1960. We had booster 50D, which indicated it was the 50th D model that had come off Convair's production line. And we still didn't have enough flight experience on our abort sensing system to flight closed loop. So we flew it open loop on this flight in addition, we had uh, the, one of the production capsules, but they had ballast in there, obviously no astronaut yet, to simulate the weight and CG of the astronaut. And they had, NASA had made a decision earlier that they were not going to fly and escape the rocket tower on this flight. Uh, over the objections, I might uh, point out to, about the, uh, from Ben Homan and the Atlas uh, program manager of the Air Force. So we flew with no escape tower, and this flight was a ballistic flight, not a, an orbital one, because its purpose was to check the re-entry heating capability of the heat shield on the spacecraft and the spacecraft structure itself. So the trajectory was to loft them up and out of the atmosphere, atmosphere then to bend the tra trajectory back and drive the capsule back down into the atmosphere to simulate re-entry heating. And then we had the standard recovery down in the South Atlantic. Here is a shot of Mercury Atlas One lifting off the pad. Incidentally, it was my first trip to Florida and my first ever real-time missile launch. And on this flight and all the subsequent flights, I watched it from a platform that was on the roof of the um, control building that Range Safety used uh, during the flights, and rain safety was nice enough that up on the platform they had speakers and they piped in there the chatter that was going on in the blockhouse of uh, whichever launch was going. So it was about a half a mile back from the stand and full frontal view, so it was a great place to watch it. And I would go over there about the last hour, hour and a half of the countdown uh, for the launch, watch it off the pad, on this particular day, as you can see, it was a real grungy day at the Cape. There were scud clouds all over the place. Had a very low ceiling that day, and there was a light rain coming down. Great, great day for a launch. And we, the countdown went fine, and it w went off the ground in an orderly fashion, as we used to say. And uh, not long, it disappeared into the clouds where I couldn't see it but I could still hear it roaring. I tell you, I've heard a lot of missile launches since then and nothing impressed me like the roar of the Atlas engines when that thing lifted off. It shook everything in the countryside. And so it went out of sight and I couldn't see it, but I could hear it. And so I was listening to it and then all of a sudden there was dead silence. We had a structural failure at 59 seconds into the flight at 43,000 feet altitude, uh, which was where max alpha Q was and the maximum bending load on the vehicle. So the question was, what caused the structural failure? We on the Atlas side, of course, said, hey, the Atlas has plenty of structural margin to carry this payload. 
even through max Q alpha. So obviously the capsule adapter must have induced point loads into our interface ring and cause failure of the front end of the Atlas that caused it to come apart. Well, of course, McDonnell Aircraft said, oh, no, no, they're, uh, they're, uh, uh, the uh, connection between the, the capsule and our booster was rigid and there was no way it put in point loads and so therefore we need to go fix our, our, our bad atlas that wasn't strong enough. And so we lost that argument and uh, NASA directed the Air Force to have uh, the first four panels of all the subsequent Mercury Atlas boosters increased in thickness. Now, bless their hearts, the NASA guys were former analysts and wind tunnel test people, so they ran some wind tunnel tests of their own, and lo and behold, they found under these conditions, they got waffling around the periphery of the adapter, put point loads into the interface structure. So they directed uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, McDonald people to go beef up their adapter and that, and that was put into work. So we had two fixes now, belts and suspenders for the next flight. And at the same time, they made a very significant change to the launch criteria for all of, uh, of all of the Mercury flights. And actually it continued over for all the Gemini program too. And that was that a, a Mercury flight would not lift off on the Cape unless in at least one place on the Cape you had the ability visually and photographically to track it from liftoff to staging. And so with those three changes, we rescheduled the second flight for the next February. And so here we are in February with 67D. That vehicle was past the structural buildup part in the factory, so we couldn't do it in, uh, in production. So we came up with a one-time fix, Convair did, it was really a stainless steel girdle that got welded around the first panel on the Atlas to put in extra strength. And that was our fix for it. This was a repeat of the MA-1 mission. We now had the beefed up adapter on the, the capsule adapter. And they also decided now that, well, maybe it'd be a good idea to put that escape tower back on if they wanted to get the capsule back. And so every, with those changes, and here again, now because of the structural failure, we did our first upper winds structural analysis. And that was uh, one of the things I was supposed to coordinate. All of the Mercury Atlas launches were scheduled to go off at eight o'clock, between eight and nine in the morning. So you're guaranteed having daylight in the recovery area, both to support the launch and to support the recovery. And so we tanked fuel the evening before, and then we started the countdown at midnight. And at midnight then, the air weather officer at Patrick Air Force Base south of the Cape released the first of two radio sun weather balloons that went up measuring atmospherics on up through the sensible atmosphere. And that took about an hour, an hour and a half to get the data. I would get up at midnight, and by the time I got dressed and had breakfast, I was out at the Cape at 2 o'clock. And at that time, he called me and gave me the winds aloft data, where he gave me the wind velocity and direction for each 1,000 feet from sea level to 60,000 feet. And if there were any wind shears that were measured, then he gave me the altitude and the velocity and the direction of the shear. I took that information and got on the telephone back to our uh, structural dynamics people here in Los Angeles who had a trajectory simulation ready to go. They put in these real winds, ran the trajectory simulation to make sure we still had a uh, good structural margin th through the flight, particularly through max Q alpha. Then they would call me back on the phone and give me the go, no go, uh, go ahead. And I'd get on the horn then with uh, Ben Homan and the uh, blue suit program manager, Colonel Brundon, who were in the blockhouse and give them the go, no go uh, for winds aloft for the flight. Fortunately, we never had to call uh, a scrub nor even a hold on upper winds, but we performed this analysis throughout the program. 
and here's MA2 lifting off. As you can see, it's a bluebird day for this flight, and uh, the flight was fine. We put it through its paces. The capsule passed all of its reentry testing, and we were ready then to go with the next flight on our two-month schedule interval. This was 100D, and now we had enough flight test experience on our abort sensing package. We were ready to fly it actively in closed loop on our Mercury Atlas flights. Uh, in addition, we had a new uh, autopilot uh, program for our autopilot package uh, for this particular flight. Well, let me tell you, the, the old uh, autopilot package was 1950s electrical uh, components that were in there, including vacuum tubes. And so the Blue Suiters had designed and developed and flight qualified a new solid state, lightweight, high reliability autopilot package. And it was now ready then for us to use on our flight. So that was a mod we had to this one. And this was to be an orbital flight for one revolution and then back in to the Atlantic. Instead of having ballast, uh, NASA had a black box in the capsule on this flight that not only simulated the weight and the CG of the astronaut, but it also exercised some of the capsule systems on orbit, similar to what the uh, astronaut would do. And here's the liftoff of MA3 off the pad, a lovely liftoff. Now let me pause here a minute and give you a little information on two additional areas. One is uh, Atlas liftoff and the other is range safety requirements at the Cape. Anything that flew out of the Cape had to have on board a range safety destruct package. The range safety officer's responsibility was to make sure that no errant missile going off from the Cape ended up heading in and hitting civilians on the ground either north or south or west of the Cape. And so there were ground boundaries and other rules in there that the, uh, the uh, officer, the flight safety officer tracked during the flight. On board, you had to have a two package, uh, a two piece package. One was a radio transceiver that was in con continuous communication with the range safety officer. And the second was a destruct package that was generally prime accord that was there to unzip the propellant tank so the missile would come apart and you'd have your fireball and explosion in the air and not on the ground where you'd kill somebody. And this was, he tracked these and if the missile uh, violated any of his constraints, he had not only responsibility but the unilateral authority to destroy the vehicle in flight. So he was, uh, tracking this one. Now, the other area is Atlas liftoff. Uh, all the Atlas pads at the Cape were laid out so that the pitch axis of the vehicle as it sat on the stand had an orientation of due east. And our uh, trajectories were 22 and a half degrees further south from east. And so we needed a roll program uh, to activate to line us up. So on the Atlas at liftoff, an umbilical was pulled from the boat tail area at two inch motion. And this completed circuits in the vehicle. One circuit went up to the capsule and it lit a liftoff light on the uh, console of the astronaut and it started the capsule mission clock. That's why if you were listening to the chatter back and forth between the astronaut and Capcom at liftoff, you would always hear the astronaut say, I have liftoff and the clock has started. And that's the genesis of those statements. Now, the our abort sensing system, uh, or the autopilot, I'm sorry, also got the liftoff signal. And then this activated the autopilot sequencer which first started the roll program and that rolled the Atlas around till we were on the right pitch axis. And then he, or the pitch, pitch uh, vector, then he, the roll program ceased and the pitch program kicked in, which started the pitch over trajectory and then radio guidance picked it up 
from there and delivered it, directed it on in to the insertion point on orbit. Now, back to, to this flight. On this flight, we had a wonderful liftoff. As you can see, it's climbing really sweetly. The only problem was we had an autopilot failure at liftoff and neither the roll nor the pitch program activated and it continued to climb. And so the uh, range safety officer picked this up, uh, recognized the missile was not in proper control, allowed it to get to an altitude that was sufficient to protect the test stand, and then sent the destruct command to the vehicle. Our abort sensing system worked perfect. The capsule was jerked up and off and out over the water. Uh, where it came down, its recovery chutes into the water, it was recovered, shipped back to McDonnell, refurbished, and it flew on the next flight. Now, one of the good parts, if there is one, to blowing it up as it's going straight up is all the parts come straight down. And so all of our Atlas parts came down in the palmetto bushes between the test stand and the shoreline, and so we were able to find this autopilot package, ship it back airlift to to uh, San Diego, and Convair then put it through a very extensive two-month disassembly uh, checkout and retest to determine what the problem was that had caused the failure. And what they found in this case was that on one pin, on one of the connectors on the autopilot, we had a slightly contaminated pin it was not contaminated enough to break contact on, on sitting there quiescent in 1G, but as soon as the engine started and you had the shake, rattle, and roll, caused it to break a circuit, and therefore the autopilot sequencer didn't start. So this was a quality assurance problem, not a design problem. So Convair rewrote the quality assurance uh, procedures back at the factory where there was a very strict requirement for cleaning inspection, insertion, and test of every pin on every connector on the Mercury Atlas. And that was put into effect. And now we were ready to redo this flight again with 88D and a complete repeat of the system here. And here's coming off, and this is MA4. And that was a successful flight. Everything worked fine there. We recovered the capsule. Uh, all the mission requirements were made. And remember I told you that we did a post-flight analysis back home? Well, we did that on this one, and about a week and a half into it, Bob Olander came to my office and says, we've got a real problem. On this last flight, we came within a hair of having an inadvertent abort on LOX tank low pressure on our low pressure sensors on what was a good flight. And we got a real bear by the tail. And so I said, you're right, and we're, we can't fly another one that way. We're gonna have to do something. First off, Convair is gonna have to go find and qualify a new flight regulator because the problem here was that we were stuffing all the propellant on board this vehicle we could to get all the performance we could, and so we had low oilage volumes in both the propellant tanks. And on the LOX tank, that low oilage volume plus slosh that we always got at liftoff and a valve that had very slow dynamic response characteristics got out of sync in there with the slosh, and we almost triggered the low pressure setting on the abort sensing system. So Convert had to go find a new pressure valve that had better dynamic conditions on there, and we either took a three-month or more uh, delay in the, in the uh, program waiting to get that one, or if they wanted to meet schedule and still launch without the new regulator, then we would have to offload propellant uh, in the LOX tank so that we decrease, increase the LH volume and decrease the sensitivity there at liftoff. And so I said, okay, we got to tell the world about this. So we went into Holman's office and briefed him on what we'd found and uh, the conclusion we'd made, and he agreed and said, okay, let's go see Brendan. So we marched into Brendan's office and brought him on board, and he agreed, and then they got the program manager at Convair on the horn, and we brought him up to speed, and he agreed and said, I'll get my engineering people on at Pronto 
finding and qualifying a new pressure regulator. Then Homan turned to me and says, okay, we've got to tell NASA, so I'll set you up with a meeting with Chris Kraft, the chief flight director, uh, for day after tomorrow. So tomorrow morning, you, be, you and Oland are be on an airplane going to Florida to meet with Kraft the day after. So we did, and we met Chris and hang arrest in his office there at the Cape. He was down there doing sims. And I gave him the rundown on what had happened, what the problem was, and what the two options were uh, for the next flight or subsequent flights. Well, now, Kraft had a lot on his mind to begin with, and I had just made his, his uh, day a lot worse. <laughs> uh, and when I finished, he went ballistic. And uh, the first thing I thought was, don't shoot the messenger. <laughs> uh, but Kraft was an excellent engineer and a good guy. And so once he got that out of his system, then he calmed down. And he said, okay, uh, you're right. I agree. We cannot stand a delay in the launch schedule. So make plans to offload the propellant. I said, okay, we can do that. And by the way, uh, we will still have more than 99% probability of success, but we will not have 99.7 with the, that loss in the propellant for this mission. And we'll need a waiver for flight. And he said, okay, go on back home, make the plans and process the paperwork. And he said, I'll, uh, I'll tell uh, Gil Ruth what we're doing and bring them up to speed. And now we continued and we had the next flight on schedule on the two month interval with the reduced propellant load. And this was Enos the Chimp's uh, time to fly. And Enos was gonna go up for two revolutions with a standard re-entry. Here's Enos going off. The mission was a great success. We got him back, although I understand that after that he wouldn't touch a banana pill pellet again. <laughs> We were scheduled to do our first manned flight. And when you look back at our launch history, it was not stellar. We had two failures out of five flights. Now that's a 40% failure rate. But if you look at each one of those failures closer, you get a completely different picture. The first failure that we had there was due to the capsule adapter. That had been beefed up and we had three successful flights of that beefed up adapter since. Our problem that we had with the autopilot was not a design problem, but a quality assurance problem. The QA uh, procedures had been uh, changed over and we had two successful flights with those. So when you put all that and then couple it in with the schedule pressure that we had to fly, the decision was made, press on with the first man flight on the next one. So we're ready now for John Glenn's flight. At the end of January, there in 62. Glenn was up, he was going to go three revs and back in and the standard recovery then in the Atlantic. So we're set up now for Saturday the 27th for the launch. We go through the countdown and we get all the way down to T-13 in the count where we finished tanking, tanking locks and we had to scrub because of weather. We started off and there was a dense ground fog over the Cape that day, and the weather people thought that it might blow out, and so with schedule pressure, we went ahead and did tanking in there and then had to scrub. Now, the thing about the Atlas was, we started tanking at T-35 in the count, and now this is not really 35 minutes for flight because we had built-in holes, including a 31 built-in closer down, but 35 minutes in the count, and we finished at T-13. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, the thing about it is if you scrub the flight on or before T minus 35, then you could recycle and go the next day at the earliest or the second day at the latest. But once you crack the valves and put any locks whatsoever in the tanks, now you had clean up valve closures retest to do, and that added another day. So you had minimum of two days, maximum of three. So in this case, we took a three-day delay in the next flight. The night before that, we were tanking fuel. So they screwed up. Uh, they had an indication that there was fuel in the insulation. This insulation blanket wasn't required by us. It was in there for the operational atlases because there you had to 
bring them up on alert, fully fuel them and, and uh, put locks in, and they had to stand on ready alert for three or four hours before they went back off of alert. We didn't need it. Uh, but there, th th since it was a lightweight blanket, there was a lightweight structure that was holding it up in there. Uh, and obviously the structure was holding under 1G, but we didn't know how much was in there and really what the capacity of the structure was. So the decision was, we don't know whether it'll hold during flight or not, probably not, and so that uh, insulation vat has to come out. Now this got to be a hairy procedure because to do this, you had to drain the fuel tank, you had to take off a big access port on the bottom of the tank, put two guys inside, build a scaffold up so that one could go up 20 feet inside the tank and get the bat and bring it out and then take the, the scaffold out, clean up the tank, reseal it, recheck re it out. All this would take two weeks. Not only that, but it was not the kind of operation you wanted to do on a flat bird on the test stand. But we had one thing going for us, and that was that three weeks prior to this, fortunately, I guess, or unfortunately, they'd done the same thing on another Atlas that was carrying a NASA lunar probe payload, and they had done this procedure on the, on the uh, stand there, and the flight had been successful. So they said, okay, we've got the procedures that have been checked out and demonstrated. We've got the crew that's done it successfully once and the flight was a success. So we can't stand, and this would be months delay to ship this bird back and bring another one forward uh, or, or to wait for another one to come down. So the decision was made, well, we'll do it on the stand. So it was set up then to do the rework between January 30th and Monday, February 12th, and we'd go for launch again on Tuesday, February 13th. So that was successfully completed. Then on Tuesday the 13th, we started the countdown, got down to T minus 35 before locks tanking, had to scrub again because of surface winds. So we took a two day delay in there and tried it again on Thursday. Went down to T minus 35, same thing, scrubbed again. We took a one day delay, tried it the third time on Friday. The movie hadn't been out yet, but it was like Groundhog Day. <laughs> I was beginning to think we we're never gonna get that thing off the, off the pad. The problem we had was the launch crew had been up all night, three out of the last four nights, and they were tired. And I know they were tired because I'd been up all night three out of the last four nights and I was tired. And more importantly, John Glenn, Glenn had had to be rousted out of the caps, out of the, uh, of, uh, the sack and taken out to the capsule to sit there for an hour and a half each of those times and he really needed some R&R. &R. So they decided, okay, we'll be magnanimous, we'll take the weekend off. So we set it off then for the following Tuesday and here's a shot of Glenn being inserted into the capsule the morning of Tuesday. This port that you see him going in and out here was the ingress-egress port that was used for the, put, put him in and out, the astronaut, on the stand. Once he was in for the flight, there was a hatch that was inserted there that looked a lot like the right-hand side that you see there where the United States is printed that sealed up the cavity and was held in with 50 bolts. And on this day, they broke one of the bolts, and so we had to take an unplanned 30 minute hole in the count for them to extract and replace that broken bolt. And then we continued on with the count. Now we got down to 9.45 a.m. ready to go and lo and behold everything was go. We had engines start and finally lift off. And here's Glenn's flight lifting off pad 14. We put him in the desired orbit he went three revs for four hours and 55 minutes total time and on orbit. He re-entered uh, downrange south of Bermuda and about due east of Cuba and was picked up in great shape by a destroyer. We all know now that it was a success. We got him back safely. He became a national hero and everybody was happy. But during the flight, we had a condition to where for a considerable period of time there, 
we weren't sure we were going to get Glenn back alive. And this had to do with a, a light that came on a ground controller's console. Remember I told you that, that you had the uh, heat shield on there? Well, it was held uh, against the capsule by a structural ring. And there was a sensor on there that detected when the ring was loose. And this light came on on the ground. And the question was, is this a bad sensor or is it really loose? Because if it's really loose, it's bad news. That means that the heat shield can shift on there. And I can better explain it to you if we look over here at a picture of the capsule, the way it looks on orbit. The normal operation of the capsule on orbit is that the tower is gone and you're flying face forward. Glenn has the window there to look out and of course the periscope. And then when it's time to come back in, he turns the capsule around, uh, rear end first, and you fire the retro rockets. And there's three of them, any one of which would bring you in, but they ripple fire them. They fire for 10 seconds each. So you fire one, five seconds later, you fire the second one, five seconds later, you fire the third one. Once they're fired, you would then blow the bolts on the straps, release the package. Then you come on in, come into the atmosphere, uh, and you've slowed down, but you're still falling and uh, decelerating. And then at 21,000 feet, you pop a drogue chute out of the top of the capsule to slow it down even further. Then at 10,000 feet, a barostat pops out the three main chutes and it lowers the capsule to a water landing. Now, just before water landing, the astronaut flips a switch that releases the clamp that holds the heat shield to the back end of the capsule. And then they fire a nitrogen bottle that inflates an airbag that's packed in between the heat shield and the back end of the capsule. And this expands the airbag out initially with, and it's connected to both the heat shield and the capsule with the heat shield hanging down and along the periphery of the heat of the bag or vent holes so that when it hits the water, the heat shield hits and then the capsule collapses this airbag and squeezes the air out through those holes, much like your shock absorber does on your automobile. And the light that came on was the one that was the first of this sequence. And so the question is, is it loose? And if it is loose, then that means that coming in, that heat shield could move off center and expose the rear end of the capsule to re-entry heating, which would cook the astronaut. And so if it were indeed loose, we had a bad situation there in flight. Now, all this was discussion going on on the ground. Glenn was not aware of any of this, and they didn't make him aware of it. There was a discussion and an argument going on because there were two solutions here. We had to bring him back in. You can't leave him up there. And so the question is, what do you do? Well, one solution is you go through the normal sequence, and now you're rolling the dice about whether you kill him or not. The other is you do as best you can, and that is you fire the retros to decelerate you. Then you leave the retro package where it is, pressed up against the heat shield. So it'll at least hold the heat shield against the back end of the capsule until it burns off, and then you know, you're know you left with what you're left with. The flight director, Walt Williams, and the spacecraft designer, Max Faget, said, leave it on. Chris Graff, the chief flight director, said, go through the normal situation because if one of those three retro rockets has any propellant left in it, it could cook off and explode during re-entry, which would kind of exacerbate uh, or uh, accentuate your problem, not exacerbate it. So that discussion went back and forth and Gilruth then sided with Williams and uh, Faget over overrode craft and they decided they would change the reentry conditions. So all this again going on without Glenn having a, any idea of it. So Gordon Cooper, who was a Capcom, called up to him and said, John, we got a change we want to make now for reentry. Just go ahead and fire the 
retros and leave them on and just bring them on in with you. Casually. <coughs> and Glenn says, why the change? And, he, and all Cooper would say was, well, that's what the engineers want. And so he said, well, okay. And that's what they did. Now, once they got the capsule back on the ship, they discovered that it was secure. Uh, but let me tell you, when Glenn got back, Glenn and the astronauts had to come to Jesus meeting with uh, NASA brass and made in no uncertain terms that on any future launch, anything that had anything to do that involved the astronaut on orbit, the astronaut would be brought into not only the discussion, but the decision making on what was going to go on. So with that, the pressure was off. Carpenter repeated Glenn's flight there in, uh, in May. Shara then went up for six orbits uh, in October. Cooper then went on a, a long duration mission a year later that actually set uh, the international time on orbit record for a period of time there with us. Now NASA de determined that, okay, they had enough information from the single man program, and so they canceled MA-10 flight, which Shepard was due to fly in August, and uh, decided they would put all of their emphasis on the two-man Gemini program coming up, and canceled the Mercury program on the 1st of June. Fortunate for our group, was we had apparently done a good job for NASA on Mercury, and so Gil Ruth sent a formal letter to the commanding general of the Space Systems Division, formally requesting that our team be reassigned to do the same thing for them on all 12 of the Gemini flights with the Gemini Titan II booster and the Gemini uh, Gina target vehicle. Uh, which they did, and I was lucky enough to get promoted where on Gemini I was responsible for all the airborne hardware other than just the things I had on Mercury. Uh, and it was good for me, and I enjoyed it. But that's a story for another day. Thank you very much. Thank you for watching Peninsula Seniors Out and About here at the Western Museum of Flight and Torrance. I'm Betty Wheaton. I'll see you next time.